to Pastor John O'Shields. I'm here at Crosswell First Baptist, and we hope that you will join us tonight in singing songs of praise to worship the Lord and in letting His Word not just inform you, but allow His Word to help you to come to know Him in a deeper, more intimate way and to be used by Him to mold you and make you, and as well as all of us, more into the image of His Son, Jesus Christ. Hope everybody is well tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will sing songs of praise as we worship Him. Heavenly Father, we thank You. Lord God, we just lift up our nation, Lord God, and the nations around the world. Lord, we thank that we're thankful that we're able to be here tonight, to be able to lead others in the worship and the teaching of the Word. But Lord, we, we know that all around the world, there are men and women, boys and girls, that are sick. Lord God, we pray that you will touch and heal their bodies. Lord God, we pray that you will also touch and heal their souls and the souls of men and women, boys and girls all around the world. Lord, we pray that during this terrible crisis, that instead of having us focused on the things of this world, we will be focused on the things of eternity. And we will be focused on you, O oh Lord, and on our relationships with our brothers and sisters. That, Lord God, that you will bring about a mass revival. That, Lord God, that you will bring about a healing of souls as well as a healing of bodies. Lord, we pray for our, our president, for our leaders. We pray for the doctors and the nurses and the first responders and the police and the firemen, all those that are that are at the forefront. And Lord, we pray that you will bless them, protect them, keep them safe, keep them healthy, just encourage them. And Lord, we pray that you, in the middle of all of this, will be worshipped and glorified as God. We praise your holy name, in Jesus' name, amen. Please join us now as we worship him.
nothing changed in my life. All I got to do is call on him. <clears throat>
We've been working on getting an FM transmitter, but unfortunately, they seem to be as scarce as toilet paper. <laughs> so if you know anything about me, they're just not out there. But if anybody, if any of our Crosswell First Baptist folks has one, or know somebody that does have one, please get in touch with me, and we'll try to see if we can uh, hook it in for a little better sound. But I have confidence in our media team that they will be able to have sound hooked up in the parking lot and ready to go on Easter Sunday morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are above all powers, above all thrones, above all kings. You're above all created things. Lord, at a time like this, that sure is comforting to think about and ponder on, to know that none of this has caught you by surprise, that you, you're not sitting up in heaven wondering, wow, I didn't see this one coming, that you know all things, but Lord God, we know that you will, you will hear prayers, that you will bring healing, that you will bring a great revival out of this. Lord, we pray that you will use even this terrible time to help people to stop from the hustle and bustle of every day and to recognize what is important. Lord, it's sad that it takes something like this for us to slow down and to face our own mortality, to think about that tomorrow something may happen and I may not be here. Lord, that's something that we deal with every day, but we're just so busy we don't stop to think about what might happen and about what will inevitably one day happen unless you come back. But Lord, we pray again for healing for the sick, for protection for the healthy. But Lord God, we pray most of all for the greatest healing that any man or woman or boy and girl can ever have. That is the healing of souls through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord God, let those that do not know you come to know you. Lord God, use this for your glory and for the good of me. We trust you, Lord, and we're thankful that you are above all things. Lord, use your word now. Let your word be poured deeply within us, Lord God, to use it to draw us to you, whether it is to draw us to you for salvation or to draw us to you to make us more like your son for sanctification. But Lord God, work within us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bible or a Bible app on your phone or your, your tablet or whatever, please turn to Acts chapter 1. We're going to start in Acts chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 12 to 26. Acts chapter 1, verses 12 to 26, with our focal verses being right around 12, 13, 14, 15 for tonight. You know, we started teaching on the book of Acts right after the first year, and I think that 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 God inspired me to do such, that he led me and guided me to start on this, and I can't think of a book that would be more appropriate for such a time as this. In Acts, the early church, everything was in flux. The Holy Spirit, as we'll see tonight, had not yet come. The church was waiting and praying for the movement of God. They were still under threat, because remember, the, the same people that had brought Jesus to the Romans for execution were still around, and they were still keeping their eye on things. Remember, the apostles had actually gotten scared and fled for their lives on the night of Jesus' arrest because they recognized that they too might be killed. But now the fear of men is gone. They are in the, they are in the upper room worshiping and fellowshipping, and they're in the temple worshiping and praising God every day, as we shall see. And then the Holy Spirit before he comes, already begins to move on them because the Bible says that they were of one mind. They were in one accord. They were united. And my prayer is that one of the things that this terrible time will do for the church is it will unite us. That it will get people off of their agenda and help them to bow and release what they want and to start focusing on what God has called them to do. So if you would, turn in your Bibles. Turn on your Bible app. app to Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, that is, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer, along with the women 
and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. At this time, Peter stood up in the midst of the brethren, a gathering of about 120 persons was there together, and said, Brethren, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit foretold by the mouth of David concerning Jesus, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was counted among us and received his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the price of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all of his intestines gushed out. And he became known to all who were living in Jerusalem, so that in their own language that field was called Pachadalon, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, let his homestead be made desolate, and let no one dwell in it, and let another man take his office. Therefore, it is necessary that of the men who have accompanied, accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning with the baptism of John until the day that he was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they put forward two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all men, show us which one of these two you have chosen to occupy this ministry. And an apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go his own place. And they drew lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias. And he was added to the eleven disciples, to the eleven apostles. Now, as we've talked about before, the end of the Gospel of Luke and the beginning of Acts actually have some overlap. So to kind of get an even more uh, informative and, and, and a, a, an even clearer idea of what was going on, we're going to look now at Luke chapter 24, verses 50 to 53. Luke chapter 24, verses 50 to 53. And he, meaning Jesus, led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And while he was blessing them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they, after worshiping him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So that kind of gives you an idea. They were in the upper room devoting themselves to prayer. But also, as we see here, they were continually in the temple praising God. Now let's look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 13. And let's talk a little bit more about all of this. When they entered the city, after coming back from, from the Mount of Olives, out as far as Bethany, where Jesus ascended into heaven, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Now, the upper room here is in the original Greek, from what I've been able to tell. I'm not a Greek scholar. I can read some. But what I could tell, and I double-checked, and that, that upper room is modified by a definite article. So it's a the upper room, a specific place. Now, more than likely, this is pop, more than likely the, the same one that they actually had the Last Supper in with Jesus. Now, we can't be sure. It may not have been, but there's, it's definitely very possible that it could be. And um, some commentators, as I've studied through the years, have even suggested that this upper room where they celebrated the Passover and turned the Passover into the Lord's Supper may have even been the house of John Mark's mother. Or it could be that they were staying in the upper room of the house of John Mark's mother after Jesus was taken and arrested and returned back there. The reason we see this is in Acts chapter 12, verse 12. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. The Bible says, and when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So there's a lot of scholars that believe that. Now, I've got to be honest, we don't know this for sure. It would seem to fit. What we do know is what the Bible tells us absolutely is that this upper room was in a house that was within the city's walls, that was within a Sabbath day journey of where Jesus ascended into heaven. So that sort of gives you a rough idea. Now, you know, during the, the in Jerusalem during that time, 
there was an upper room in almost all the houses in the city of Jerusalem, and there were really big, nice upper rooms in the homes of wealthy people and those that were sort of prominent citizens. And it was sort of used as a, as a large family room. It was used for family gatherings. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was used for prayer and, 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 and things like that. Uh, it was also used, I, uh, some commentators believe that uh, dead people were taken there and they were sort of, you know, uh, uh, taken there before the, the, their burial, whether it was for viewing, kind of like we do today in the funeral homes. We don't really know. There were some commentators said that, some disagreed with that. But most homes had this large upper room. Now, and it says where they were staying in Acts chapter 1, verse 13. When they had entered the city, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. So they were definitely staying in this upper room during the time that Jesus, after his resurrection, was with them. And the, again, in the Greek, it has sort of the imperfect tense verb, sort of given the imperfect tense, uh, uh, tense there, saying that they were staying there a lot permanently that it seemed to be that was sort of like the, the, the their operate center of operations I guess you could say during this time now again it was probably the room that they had hidden in during the time that Jesus was in the tomb and they thought that all was lost and you know they, they were scared to death that the the, 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 the the chief priests and the, and the and the temple guard was going to come and get them and take them as well but then it gives a list of all the apostles now let's kind of look at those it seems like they've kind of been divided uh, by the Holy Spirit here as he gives their names. You sort of have a, the first group he talks about here is Peter and John and James and Andrew. Then there kind of seems to be a second group here of Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew. And then there was kind of a third group, that of James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the, the zealot and Judas the son of James. Now, of course, Peter, we know a lot about. He was definitely the, the, the spokesman, sort of the leader of the twelve. And he was one of the three that was closest to Jesus. And um, we, we know, again, this list of apostles because in Luke chapter 6, verses 13 to 16, we get a list of them again. And there are several lists, but this is one that, that really just sort of came to mind. Uh, and when the day came, the day that he called, he called his disciples to him, and he chose 12 of them, whom he also named his apostles, Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now, to sort of break this down, these names seem to be a little bit different than, than some other lists, but what you have to understand is Bartholomew is also called Nathaniel, and Judas, the son of James, is also called Thaddeus. And um, this James, the son of Alphaeus, is a different James than the brother of John, and he's also a different James than the half-brother of Jesus who wrote the book of James. Then James, the son of Alphaeus, is often called by some scholars, you know, James the Less or James the Lesser, to differentiate him from James, the half-brother of Jesus, who became a leader in Jerusalem, or the Apostle James, which, um, you know, I've always wondered, how would, you, how would you feel if, you know, Jesus was introducing people, and he's like, this is James, and this is James the Lesser. I mean, you know, I've, I've often wondered how uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, felt about that. Then you have James, of course, the son of Zebedee. Uh, he's always listed uh, uh, along with John. We don't really know a lot about James, the son of Alphaeus. Uh, uh, Fox's Book of Martyrs gives us some extra biblical information. Simon the Zealot, remember, Simon Peter was known as Simon, and Jesus gave him the nickname of Little Rock Peter. And maybe one of the reasons he did this was to differentiate him uh, from Simon the Zealot. Now, the Zealots, nobody really knows. Is it a, a reference to a group of uh, very patriotic Jews that wanted to overthrow Rome? Some people, some scholars have said that uh, it was 
determined that he was he was from Cana, and that's sort of why they they used that. But we don't really know. But that is the name he was known by. Then moving down to Acts chapter one verse fourteen, the Bible says these all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Now, so what's going on when they're out in the upper room? What are they doing? They're praying. And when they're not in the upper room, what are they doing? Well, let's flip over back to Luke chapter 24, verse 53. Luke 24, 53 says, And were continually in the temple praising God. Now again, unbelievers like to say, oh, oh, there's a contradiction. You say that your Bible doesn't have contradiction. It's not a contradiction. It is a completion given by the Holy Spirit to give you a complete idea of what's going on. Just like on the way here tonight from my house, I drove to the church. But on the way, I stopped up at the gas station and put some fuel in my truck. Okay? One person might be here tonight and say, I saw Sean at church tonight. Someone else may say, I saw Sean up at the speech on a 123, puts a few in his truck. Both of those are true. Now, they might seem to be uh, two opposite things, but they're not a contradiction. If somebody says, I saw him up there and then went to church and, 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 and saw him because they were on the praise team, then you have a complete version of what happened. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit's done here. The Holy Spirit inspired Dr. Luke to put that section in there. And this section in here, when you read the two often together, you get a more complete idea of what's going on. You know, um, sort of kind of like the, the old Paul Harvey thing, the rest of the story. You know, I mean, you, you get the whole complete idea of what's going on here. When they were in the upper room, they were praying. When they were not in the upper room, they were at the temple worshiping and continually praising God. Now, think about what they're doing, folks. And this is where this comes into a lesson for us right now. The danger was not over for these people. They had just recently taken Jesus about 40 days earlier, plus three days earlier, and turned him over to Rome to be crucified and executed. When they came to arrest him in the garden, there was a bunch of them. In fact, Pilate had actually given some of his soldiers to the temple to, to, to be part of the, te the, the uh, temple guard, along with the temple guard, to be there to arrest Jesus and then actually allowed the chief priest to post, post Roman sentries, Roman soldiers, at the, the, uh, the tomb of Jesus. They had just recently basically murdered Jesus. They had blood on their hands. They were doing everything they could to stomp out Jesus' teaching and anybody that followed him. Remember, Peter was so frightened that three times he denied the Lord. And think about what's going on. These men were no longer living in fear. Now, they weren't going up to the chief priests and the scribes holding up a sign saying, I was with Jesus, come and get me if you can. They were using sense but they were not living in fear anymore. And folks, that is exactly what I think God wants us to do today. We need to use sins. We have very few people here tonight. Our praise team is scattered out. If any one of us is running a temperature or doesn't feel good, we're not coming. We wash our hands. We wipe down our mics. We cover our cough. We don't go out. We're staying as close in as we can. We're wanting to do our part to prevent the spread of this disease. But at the end of the day, we're going to do everything we can. We're going to eat right, get plenty of rest, wash our hands, take care of ourselves, avoid being out in open places, all that stuff. But at the end of the day, we're not going to cower in our homes with fear. When we're in our homes, we will be praying and continually worshiping and praising God. Amen. God does not want his people to live in fear. That's right. Now, we're not to go out and do something ridiculous that, 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 makes, that defies common sense, but we are to not live in fear. These men were no longer hiding. They were going to the temple. They were publicly praising God. People were able to see them. They were praying for themselves, for, the, for, the, for God's kingdom 
for the Holy Spirit to come. They weren't locking themselves in the upper room. Remember what happened after Jesus was, was crucified? They were hiding in the upper room. They locked themselves in. They weren't letting anybody come in. Were they having their food delivered? Who knows? Maybe some of the ladies were going and getting it. Maybe, maybe somebody was bringing food to them. But we don't know. But they had locked themselves in. They weren't doing that anymore. They were gathering for prayer. Then they were going to the temple. And they were waiting on the promise of the Holy Spirit. They stayed there and prayed. Then they went out and worshipped and praised God in the temple. And they did it with joy. And think about this. Praise in the temple and prayer back together in the room. This is an entirely new thing for them. They were trusting in the Lord. They had just seen him ascend into heaven, into what many people, and, and I myself agree, was not just a cloud, but the Shekinah glory of God. Now think about this. Look at what they were before. In John chapter 20, verse 19, Jesus makes a post-resurrection appearance to them. Notice what it says in verse 19. So when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were, why? For fear of the Jews. They were scared. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. They went from fear to faith. And that's where God has called us to go, folks. To not live our lives in fear. They were staying in the upper room and leaving to pray. John Stott has a great quote on this. John Stott, quote, So they were praising and praying over the next ten days. It was a healthy combination. Continuous praise in the temple and continuous prayer at home, end quote. Can I make a suggestion? I think that's an awful good combination for us today as well. Continuous praise and continuous prayer. And folks, I want to be honest with you. I think that's where we need to be today. I'm going to say something. I've had a lot of people say, Pastor Sean, do you believe that this virus is the wrath of God on America? I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm going to answer that question. Every week I stand up and I speak for God, but I speak for God through His Word. I try not to take my own opinions, my own ideas, Every week, I want to make sure that I accurately share the Word of God because I believe it is in the infallible, without error, God breathed that Word. I'm not going to speak where God has not definitely spoken. What I can say is this. This virus is definitely because there is sin in the world. Where there is sin, there is death. There is sickness. But I will tell you this. I do believe that this virus is a wake-up call right. for all of us to truly stop and think about what matters. Yeah. Is it God's wrath on America? If it is, then we surely deserve it. If it is not, if it is simply God allowing the course of the sinful world to take place again, it is a wake-up call. In America, we have allowed sin to go unchecked. And by the way, if it is God's wrath, I don't believe it's God's wrath on unbelievers. I believe it's God's wrath on His church. Because we, the people who are called by His name, have allowed pride, arrogance, hate, and sin to creep, other sin to creep into our life. We're more concerned about our agenda than we are about God's holiness. We're more concerned about building ourselves up than we are about spreading the gospel. And I believe it's that God's people need to repent and need to draw closer to him first and then to get busy sharing the gospel with everyone else. Is it God's wrath? I don't know, but I do know this. I think it's a wake-up call for us. But it's not something we're living in fear. I think we are to live in faith and to use this time to draw closer to him and to spread the gospel more and more. I think praise and prayer is the combination for Christians in America and around the world today. And I believe that repentance and confession and asking for forgiveness is also in order as well. Let's look back at Acts chapter 1, verse 14. 
These all with one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. With one mind. That means a unity of mind. A purpose, a unanimous purpose of mind. Some translations say of one accord. And that's exactly what it means. In the original, the, one of my understanding is the original language, it means to be of one soul. Folks, that is one thing I believe that God wants to accomplish during this time, is for his church to be of one soul again. Instead of bringing our multiple agendas in, we have one agenda. Worship the Lord. Evangelize the world. And teach believers to obey all he has commanded. That is what our unity of mind needs to be. This, what we're doing tonight on the internet is because there is unity of mind and purpose. You've got people that are willing to risk their lives, literally, to go out and take their time to make sure that we can continue in the mission that God has given us to worship Him and to pre preach His Word and teach, proclaim His message. We need to be of one mind. John Calvin says in one of his commentaries, quote, the two essentials for true prayer, they persevered and they were of one mind, end quote. They kept on in prayer and they had one mind. Unity of purpose Meaning of prayer and praising God came from that unity of mind, and the unity of mind in turn fed into the unity of purpose. You see, one feeds the other in a continuous cycle that builds each one of them up. You are united in prayer and in praise, and that in turn makes you united in one mind. And the more united you are in one more, more in mind, the more your prayer life and your praise life begins to grow. Folks, I'm going to be honest with you. So many people come out and they're like, I have a new seminar. It's only $199. And if you purchase this, it's going to add power to your church. Folks, I'll be honest with you. I think right here is the answer for power in your church. Right. Prayer and praise coming from being in one mind. Yep. Folks, I really believe that the churches that are truly God bless and are growing, are growing because they have one mind, that unity of purpose. It right. is prayer, worship, evangelism, and teaching discipleship. Right. And folks, I believe that's one of the reasons the church is so weak in the world today is because we're not of one mind. And you know what? I think in our churches in America, I can't speak around the world. I've got friends that are pastors all around the world. And in other parts of the world, it's not like that. But I can tell you, in America, I think sometimes in church, we spend more time working and praying for peace among God's people, trying to avoid a commotion in the church, than we do praising and praying for the Lord to be glorified, for the lost to be saved, and for the saved to be disciples. That is one of the prayers that I have during this time, is that people will recognize that we, the church, are here with a purpose. And that purpose is to carry out the Great Commission. To love God and to love others. And at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter what color the carpet is. At the end of the day, it doesn't really matter who the chairman of the Board of Deacons is as long as he is a godly man and God has called him to serve. It doesn't matter who the pastor is as long as he is a godly man and God has called him to serve. It's time that we focus on our mission rather than our own craziness. It's time we stop forward in a personal agenda and start focusing on one another. Back to Acts 114. They were with all of one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You see, the disciples weren't by themselves. It wasn't just 11 dudes up in this upper room praying and running down to the temple. It says, along with the women. Now, I want you to know, this is not a, 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 a phrase of, of derision. It's a term of endearment. These women had followed Jesus so much, and they were with the disciples that they were known as the women. 
the women that were with Jesus. You know, we, we've heard some of the names, Mary Magdalene, uh, Mary and Martha, uh, Salome, uh, Mary the wife of Cleopas, and some other names. And they've been around so long and followed Jesus so closely that they've become so identified with him and with the disciples, they were known as the women. They were women that loved the Lord and they followed Jesus. They were around. They were the first to know that he had risen. They had followed Jesus for a long time. And they also, all of them, were continually devoting themselves to prayer and praising God in the temple. So understand, it wasn't just the guys that were sitting around, the disciples, the apostles. The women were there, and they were praying along with them. They were praying just as fervently and with as much passion. But understand this, the prayers that they were, were, were praying, they were, I'm sure, praying for the coming of the Holy Spirit. But understand, it wasn't that their prayers brought the Holy Spirit. God had already promised it to them. But I think their state of mind and their spiritual being from prayer and praise when the Holy Spirit did come is one of the reasons that God came through them with such power. They were continually devoted. The idea means to persevere, to carry on in the Greek, being single-minded in something. Folks, what would happen if we were as single-minded in prayer and praise and Bible study, in evangelism, in worship, in studying and getting to know God's Word as we are in other things? They were there, the ladies, along with Mary. And when I read this, my heart is just absolutely just filled with, with joy. Mary the mother that's heart was broken. The mother that, as a young, unwed teenage girl, found herself pregnant. And you know that what people must have said. But yet, when told, she said, I am the handmaid of the Lord. Do with me. When she, all these prophecies were made about Jesus, the rising and falling of many in Israel, she treasured those things in her heart. She watched this young man this little boy grew up into a young man and then he, he began his ministry and she watched as a, with probably an amazement as the crowds followed him and then her own heart was broken when she saw her son beaten and crucified and Mary was there and think about this the lady whose heart was broken saw her son risen from the dead and saw him ascend into the Shekinah glory of God, his task completed. Can you imagine the joy that was in her heart? And probably a little sadness that that little baby that she had once held in her arms was now taken into heaven. Along with Jesus' half-brothers. And that's where we're going to end tonight. Because I see that time is getting long. But understand the, the apostles were not by themselves. And folks, something I want you to understand. The thing that makes this time so difficult is we're all not able to be together. But I want you to understand we can still worship in unity when we sing the songs of praise. Even if we're just singing to a, a phone or a tablet or a, 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 a computer or even if you're able to put it up on a big screen TV. And cross the first batches, I just want you to know I love y'all. And I miss you. But I'm just a phone call away. I'm trying to call people as, and, and connect with people as much as I can and have prayer with them. So just know if you need, need me or you want to have prayer, call me. And we'll pray together. But know this, you may not be here in your body, but you are here in my heart. And there is a day coming where we will gather here together again. Yes. And we will worship Him yes. in you. So... Just know I miss you until that time. Let's continue to worship him through music, and then we will close in prayer. And if the praise team is coming up, don't forget on Easter Sunday morning at 1030, we're going to have a drive-up service, so come and stay in your car, and we'll be able to be safe, or you can join us online.
but however you want to do it, make sure that you're with us on that special morning. about a great revival, that Lord God, 